So hello everyone, I think we'll get started now. My name is Christine Lamberson and I am the director of the history office at the Federal Judicial Center. Thank you for attending this evening. Um, this program is jointly sponsored by the Federal Judicial Center and the American Bar Association. Um, you just heard from my colleague, Kathy Hawk, at the, who is the Associate Director of the Division of Public Education at the ABA. And this program grows out of and is part of our Teaching with Federal Trials series. The FJC and the ABA jointly sponsor a week-long summer teacher institute, almost every summer, not this past summer, but normally we do, uh, that focuses on federal trials and great debates in US history. During that week, attendees learn about multiple famous trials, meet judges and scholar experts, collaborate with other teachers, and visit federal courts in the DC area. This program that we're having this fall, and we had another one earlier during the summer, is designed to help those of you who have attended a past institute to learn about another case, another trial, and for those of you who haven't attended an institute or are not familiar with our materials, to get a taste of the type of content discussed during those institutes and to get a little bit more information about how you might teach with federal trials in your classroom. So in this session tonight, you'll be hearing about the trial from our scholar expert who I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, you'll be hearing about the flag salute cases, so multiple cases tonight. And then in our next session, which will be next Monday, November 16th, also at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, you'll be hearing from two experienced teachers about how they use this case in their classroom. So I'm gonna introduce our speaker tonight and then uh, Kathy is gonna give you a little bit of technical information before we actually get started. So our speaker is Professor Chris Capazzola, who's a professor of history uh, at MIT. His research interests are in the history of citizenship, war and the military in modern American history. His first book, Uncle Sam Wants You, World War I and the Making of the Modern American Citizen examines the relationship between citizens, voluntary associations, and the federal government during World War I. His second book, which just came out this year, is titled Bound by War, How the United States and the Philippines Built America's First Pacific Century. And he'll be telling us this evening about the flag salute cases as well as the, their historical context. So before I turn it over to him, I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy, who will tell you a little bit about our technical information. Thank you, Christine. And thank you, Professor Capazola, for joining us this evening. Um, I'm assuming most folks are pretty familiar with Zoom by this point in 2020, uh, but we have both the Q&A and the chat functions open. So if there is something you wanted to flag for all the participants in the chat, you are welcome to. Otherwise, if you have a question for um, Professor Capazola, please go ahead and put it in the Q&A. We will be taking um, a moment during the session to answer some questions and then again at the end. Uh, we are recording this program and we will send a note with the link um, to the recording once it's completed and up on our website. Um, and Professor Capazzola will also be making his PowerPoint slides available. Uh, we'll make sure you get that via email also at the end. So I think that should answer all the questions. If not, feel free to um, put something in the Q&A for me and I'll get back with more information. And with that, Professor, take it away. All right, thank you, Kathy, um, and thank you, Christine. Um, a real thanks to the, the FJC and to the ABA for assembling these uh, online seminars to complement the week-long uh, seminars that happen over the summer, which I hope if you haven't participated in them, you consider uh, participating. And I, I got to do one two years ago, and it's a really fantastic uh, experience. Um, so I also wanted to thank Winston Bowman for putting together a really excellent resource guide, which um, you know I hope you uh, get a chance to look at. It's pretty intense, so take a look at at least some of it um, uh, to really dig into these two interesting cases. Uh, this, um, as uh, Kathy mentioned, this is the first of two sessions. Um, tonight, I'm going to focus on a series of federal cases known as the flag salute cases, um, beginning um, with the facts of, of the cases and the participants as well as the broader historical context. Then we'll look specifically at federal court rulings in the cases and look sort of line by line at a couple of the key uh, arguments in those decisions. And then we'll consider their long-term legacies and how they in, in interact with some enduring questions in constitutional history and civics that you may be teaching across the curriculum. I will also say um, that Christine left out one very important part of my bio, which is that I started um, in this whole historical profession uh, by teaching seventh, eighth, and ninth grade social studies. Um, so I am deeply um, interested not only in this history, but in how you teach it in your classrooms. 
Um, so happy to talk a little bit about that in the Q and A as well, but also maybe you know flag some things that may um, you know may seem a little uh, sort of pitched a little high for the K twelve classroom, but um, you know but here tonight um, you'll be getting a whole lot of history, and we can talk more in the Q and A about how to teach it, or you can talk a little more about that next week as well. All right, so what I want to do now is just dive right in, and I'm going to share screen and project. So give me a second here. All right. Um, and these uh, flag salute cases are in fact actually a couple of different cases that uh, happened between the 1930s and 1943, um, coming first from Pennsylvania uh, and then from West Virginia, right in the middle of the World War II uh, era. And they are incredibly important for Americans to know uh, because they are an important articulation of our civil liberties and, and, and how they will be defended by the courts. Um, they are also really useful for educators to teach with because they are very teachable. Uh, they raise enduring questions about the Constitution that are never going to go away, questions about balancing rights of, um, and obligations, questions of religion, speech, and the First Amendment, um, and also the power of majorities and minorities in, under the Constitution, and also the role of the federal courts in protecting those rights and preserving its own precedents. Um, and one of the best reasons why these are very teachable is that most of the plaintiffs are between 12 and 16 years old um, and the cases take place in schools. Um, so this is a very, you know, this is a kind of history that students can really wrap their mind around um, in ways that other topics may be harder for them. Um, it, they are complicated cases and I'm just gonna walk through them and, and we'll think about some of the issues and feel free to raise questions in the Q&A as we go along. I'm gonna start by being very um, abstract um, and I'm not gonna start with the cases, I'm going to start with a question. And this is too big of a group really to, um, you know, to do breakout sessions or Q and A or, or anything like that. But I want you to just individually as you're watching this, jot down some mental notes to some of the following questions. Um, first of all, um, I wanna just ask you, are you patriotic? Okay. We don't have to answer that um, in the Q&A or the chat, but just what is your own answer to that question? And then following that up, how do you know that you are or are not patriotic? Whatever answer you gave, yes or no. And then third, how would you prove it? How would you prove that you either are or are not patriotic? These kinds of questions are going to come up in these cases. Now, let me ask you a couple more. The next question, should schools teach patriotism? Should they teach children um, uh, this as either uh, an obligation of citizenship or a virtue um, uh, that, they, that students might uh, develop? And just as importantly, can patriotism be taught? Um, is this something that can be directly taught um, through historical lessons, through civics, through rituals such as the Pledge of Allegiance or the salute to the flag or the singing of the national anthem? Um, or is patriotism something that can only develop from within a person, from a citizen, um, and cannot be taught in school? Now, if your answer uh, to that question is yes, um, you're going to encounter um, some state authorities in uh, West Virginia and Pennsylvania who agreed in 1940 and 1942 that schools should teach patriotism and that it can be taught. If your answer was uh, that it, it shouldn't be, or in fact, that it can't be, right? And that, that it cannot be taught, I have a follow-up question for you, right? So if you are one of those people who said, well, patriotism is all well and good, but it's not something that can be taught in a classroom, I'm going to ask you another question. And as soon as you answer it, I want you to, as soon as you hear it, I want you to answer it as soon as you can. Question is not about patriotism. The question is, what do you do if your clothes catch fire? And of course you all immediately knew the answer to that question. Stop, drop and roll, right? Um, and this, is a, this shows that on some level, um, teaching people, even at a young age, something that they may never need to know or may not know that they need to know um, and, and sort of training them into it through symbolism and ritual um, does sometimes work. This is what one of the Supreme Court cases we'll look at this evening called a shortcut from mind to mind. 
But of course, uh, the question of, of protecting students and children from, uh, from fire and, and protecting a nation from outside threat is, are different. And, and that's in part what these cases tonight look at. Right? Now, those are some really abstract questions. Right? And what I wanna do now is turn to some specifics about that history. And these um, historical contexts begin um, in 1935 in Pennsylvania, where state law had made it a legal requirement for all public and private schools in the state to quote, teach civics, including loyalty to the state and national government. Now each, each town in Pennsylvania had uh, some liberty to define that, uh, that requirement, but they were all under that obligation. Uh, and the town of Minersville, Pennsylvania in 1935 had just adopted school, regu school level regulations requiring all students to salute the flag using something called the Bellamy salute. You see an image of that here um, in this photograph, um, not from Pennsylvania, um, but from that general time period. Uh, the Bellamy salute is named after the author of the Pledge of Allegiance, Bellamy, um, and it was involved raising your hand and saluting the flag, notice with the palm up. Um, but of course, this is 1935, right? And the symbolism of this is not, um, and, it's, and its similarity to other salutes around the world would very soon become an issue of politics. Now, and after Minersville, Pennsylvania adopted this rule in 1935, two students at the school, on the left, William Gobitis, on the right, Lillian Gobitis, uh, refused to engage in the salute. Um, they were Jehovah's Witnesses, um, uh, members of a religious group who believe that, uh, that this violates the, the Ten Commandments and its, uh, and its sort of prohibition of having any other God before me. Right? and that a salute to a flag was the worship of a false idol. They, along with their father in the middle, Walter, uh, sued in a federal district court seeking an injunction to overturn the Minersville School Board and to ad uh, admit the children to school. They were in fact expelled from school um, by the Minersville district for refusing to engage in the flag salute. Uh, and I put this source up as well. You can find this on the website of the Library of Congress. Um, this was written by uh, William Gobitis in November of 1935 to the school board um, where he's explaining, I do not salute the flag because I have promised to do the will of God. He goes on to explain his arguments. And um, this is a, a great source to use in your classroom um, on the condition that people know how to read cursive. Um, but if they, if, if they can read the letters, um, it's a great letter uh, to read. Now, the Gobitis has brought their case um, in a, a local district court in Pennsylvania. They won their first um, injunction um, and, and they were allowed uh, to return to school um, where they in fact faced uh, opposition and bullying. Um, and eventually the case made its way to the US Supreme Court, which heard oral argument on April 25th, 1940. Now, I think it's important um, by this point to uh, move to a broader historical context because these dates in the 1930s and the 1940s, if you know about the coming of World War II, um, you know that there's a broader national and global context that these cases will be heard in. Right? I want to address three key historical contexts that I think help us understand what's in the back of the mind of federal judges, both at the local um, district appeals and Supreme Court level, as they're thinking about these cases. First um, is the First World War, um, which uh, had just happened uh, just about you know, a generation earlier, and that led to violence against dissenters and the suppression of religious and cultural minorities. The image you see here, um, uh, it's a very disturbing one when you look closely, is of a man who had been tarred and feathered um, for his opposition to the First World War in an incident of mass violence in Wisconsin um, during World War I. Um, and many people um, in America felt that the United States had gone too far during the First World War in suppressing uh, religious and cultural minorities, particularly German Americans, but also including in that Jehovah's Witnesses um, who faced intimidation and sometimes prosecution for their views. Um, it, the, the First World War also generated an, a burst of Americanization efforts to make um, uh, immigrants more American, to sort of make um, patriotic education more systematic in schools, such that by the time you get to 1942, 
all 48 states practice the flag salute in schools in some fashion. This is a nationwide phenomenon. It is uh, not only universally practiced, but also universally required. So at the same time, during the First World War, some of the people who would later end up sitting on the Supreme Court had had important experiences. And here, I would flag Harlan Fisk Stone, who you see in this picture. And this is taken from when he joins uh, the US Supreme Court. But during the First World War, he was a Dean of Columbia Law School and had been tapped by the federal government to investigate its policies toward conscientious objectors. These are people whose religious beliefs led them to argue that they should not be subject to the draft, which was first implemented in a large scale during World War I. And Stone's job and during the war was to interview every single conscientious objector. He conducted nearly 5,000 interviews uh, with people who had religious objections to the, the sort of demands of the state. And I think that's got to matter, right? If you fast forward to the cases when we get to those in a few minutes, remember one of the people on the bench is someone who has met and talked to 5,000 religious objectors um, just 10 or 15 years before. A second key context is uh, the changes in the court that came with the New Deal. The image you see here is of the four is of four justices um, widely described as the four horsemen, um, for sort of uh, four consistent votes against the New Deal um, and Franklin Roosevelt's policies during the 1930s, um, and by the 19, late 1930s, um, the court had become a matter of national politics that led to a, an effort, failed effort by Franklin Roosevelt uh, to expand the court's membership um, in the so-called court packing proposal of 1937. Um, and so that fact, um, that general sense of, of the politicization of the court um, and also a sense um, that it could, uh, it had some obligation to reflect the public's views um, was probably in the back of some of the minds of the judges um, at both the local um, and at the, at the national level. Okay. Now, the third context is of course, um, the, second, the coming of the Second World War. First, um, the rise of fascism in Europe. Um, and here you see the Nazi salute um, in, its, in the, the format that we tend to think of when we think uh, of the Nazis. And notice it's different from the Bellamy salute that most American kids would have been doing in the 1930s, um, but not that different, right? And certainly um, on the, would have been a mental image for everyone in the world at this period. Um, and the, the rise of fascism casts a shadow on the entire proceedings and from start to finish. At the district court level, Judge Albert Maris in Pennsylvania said in 1938 that quote, in these days when religious intolerance is again rearing its ugly head in other parts of the world, it is of the utmost importance that the liberties guaranteed to our citizens by the fundamental law be preserved. Right? There was a sense um, that there was religious intolerance out there in the world. There was a sense um, that civil liberties and individual freedoms were under some threat, both inside the United States and of course, around the world. This also happens at the level of the US Supreme Court. When the Gobitis's case eventually reaches them um, in 1940, so the, like I said, the Supreme Court heard oral argument in that case on April 25th, 1940. Um, and the court doesn't immediately issue its answers, um, it, its rulings in cases. They have to read the briefs, they have to think about it, they have to discuss it with each other. Um, but if you think about the chronology of that spring, the Supreme Court heard oral argument on April 25th. Um, Germany invaded France on May 10th. Um, the Supreme Court issued its Gobitis ruling on June 3rd, and Nazis marched into Paris, as you see here, on June 14th. Right? So um, we cannot forget the headlines um, that are on the front page of the papers as uh, justices are making up their mind either. And, this, and in 1940, in the Gobitis case, the Supreme Court was making up its mind at a time when headlines told them that democracy was fragile, uh, and weak, right? And that was certainly part of their thinking. So what did they do, right? Um, let's take a look at this. Um, and I wanna turn now and just move very closely through uh, the first line of cases, um, the minors, a case called Minersville 
versus gobitis. Um, and here are the gobituses again. Um, at the Supreme Court, the, the gobitis family uh, lost its case um, after winning at the district and the appeals court uh, levels. And the Supreme Court affirmed uh, the, the right of the Pennsylvania, of the state of Pennsylvania and um, the Minersville School District to require the salute among its students and, uh, to, and its authority to expel those who refused to participate in it. Uh, the leading opinion comes um, from Justice Felix Frankfurter, um, who wrote the majority opinion, which was joined by almost every other justice. In it, he says, um, he makes an argument that, quote, national unity is the basis of national security. And therefore, the state had an interest in teaching it and in creating it. And Frankfurter's reasoning was, if Pennsylvania decides um, through its legislature, right, the people of Pennsylvania make this decision, if they decide that a flag salute, quote, promotes national cohesion, then the Supreme Court should not, quote, deny the legislature the right to select appropriate means for its attainment. Meaning this is the, the decision of the right of the people of Pennsylvania. If they want to teach patriotism, if they should figure out how, sort of just like Pennsylvania should be free to decide how they teach math, how they teach English, how they teach physical education. Right? Nor uh, did the court under Frankfurter buy the argument that there was any danger to the religious liberty of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Right? And Frankfurter again here writes for the majority that quote, conscientious scruples have not in the course of the long struggle for religious toleration relieved the individual from obedience to a general law not aimed at the promotion or restriction of religious beliefs, right? So he's saying this is not a law that targets Jehovah's Witnesses or discriminates specifically against them. It's a general law. And therefore a, a religious objection cannot be raised to a, a, a general law um, of, of general public good. Now, there was one dissenting vote. And if you remember um, what I told you before, you can probably guess who this was from. Um, it was from the new justice, Harlan Fisk Stone. And for Stone, this was a matter of religious liberty. Um, and he said as much, um, and in his dissent, he said, by this law, the state seeks to coerce these children to express a sentiment which they do not entertain and which violates their deepest religious convictions. So notice there's two parts in, in Stone's dissent. First, that it coerces the children to express a view, a sentiment which they do not entertain, to say, forces them to say something they don't believe and also violates uh, their deepest religious convictions. So there is a, a religious, uh, there's a speech issue in part one, and there's a religion issue in part two, two different parts of the First Amendment, right? Now, what was the consequence of this? Um, the consequence of this was um, that the Gobitis children um, were uh, once again, sort of pulled from the public schools of Pennsylvania. They ended up going to a private religious school. Um, and and at, at first the Gobitis has brought this case because uh, Walter Gobitis, the father, had basically run out of money uh, to keep his kids in private school. Um, but by this point, it had become something of a kind of national case. And so there was a fund um, which helped, helped pay for that. Um, but, um, but setting the Gobitises aside, um, this did sort of uphold state level laws all over the country. Um, and after June 3rd, it also um, led to, maybe not directly, but in some fashion um, encouraged widespread violence against Jehovah's Witnesses, um, that they were sort of targeted, bullied, um, sort of um, excluded from schools, um, often subject to, to physical violence. Um, and the other thing that happened, um, this may matter more to the nine justices of the Supreme Court um, than to people all across the country, um, is that the Supreme Court um, got a lot of criticism for this decision. That in sort of uh, in newspapers and magazines and sort of uh, law reviews where experts discuss these issues, uh, there was a widespread emerging consensus that the Gobitis decision was a terrible decision. Right, um, that it was insufficiently respectful of speech um, or, and of liberty, 
and not least of all, um, uh, as if you notice from the header at the top of, of this, not least of all because it uh, misspelled the name of the Gobitis family, right? So that you'll notice um, that, they, that their name is spelled G-O-B-I-T-A-S, but the Supreme Court um, even managed to misspell their name along the way, right? So by the time uh, 1940 comes, and by the time Pearl Harbor comes, uh, it seems pretty clear um, that, uh, that the court has spoken, um, that these laws are constitutional, um, but that there is criticism um, from all across the country uh, about this. Now, I wanna take a break here um, just for a minute or two and see if there are questions or comments. Um, I'm going to temporarily stop sharing and then just see if, um, if, if maybe you know, Kathy or Christine want to um, toss in any questions and these can be, we'll answer one or two of them, especially if they're specifically related to, to anything I've said before, but if you don't have questions, um, you can also bring them up at the end. It looks like we don't have any questions at the moment. So I would say continue along and we'll come back at the end. All right, I'm gonna keep going. All right, so let me see if I can do this. All right, so we should be right where we left off on the PowerPoint. Um, and uh, what I wanna do now is switch to a, a later case. Okay. And here, once again, um, uh, this also involves some kids, Marie and Gaithy Barnett, who you see in this image. Um, they are from Charleston, West Virginia. Um, and this is one of a uh, picture of them um, from right around 1942. By 1942, of course, the United States is involved in, in World War II in both the Atlantic and the Pacific. Um, the whole country is on a national war footing. Um, there is a draft. Um, there is sort of uh, you know, kind of uh, wage and price controls. The federal government is exerting a great deal of power um, in all kinds of areas, right, including in areas of everyday life. Um, by 1942, West Virginia becomes the last, the 48th state, um, to develop, to adopt a flag salute law. Um, that they, it had simply never really come up in the legislature in West Virginia before. But of course the legislators there knew that this was a contentious issue. They knew it had just recently gone to the Supreme Court. So when they wrote their law in West Virginia, they followed the language of Gobitis very, very closely. They used Justice Frankfurter's language to help them write a law that they assumed would therefore be constitutional, right? So they are feeling pretty confident that the law that is being developed in West Virginia um, would be, you know, would be upheld if there were any challenges. And challenges come quickly, um, in particular from uh, the Barnett family. Marie and Gaithy Barnett um, went to school every morning and uh, refused to stand for the, and to engage in the salute. Um, and were then sent home um, for failing to do so. So day after day, kind of like a suspension, right? The Gobias kids were expelled. The Barnett kids were basically suspended, right? Um, and so this is, you know, uh, so it's a, if, you know, a, an important distinction. They tried to go to school um, and they, they were not allowed to do so. They bring a challenge um, through, through their parents um, to this law. Um, and it's not really clear sort of why, you know, this case will be different, um, why the outcome will be different. Um, but um, there's through a kind of complicated federal legal maneuver, um, they managed to get the case heard at the district level or at the appeals court level, and then immediately from there um, to the US Supreme Court. So it moves very quickly to the US Supreme Court um, for complicated legal reasons that you can read about um, in the guidebook um, if you want the details. Um, but now uh, there's, it's a different court um, and a couple of things have changed, right? First, um, there, there's a war on. It's not just a war threatening in France, right? The United States is deeply involved in it. Uh, it's a war that is increasingly being defined as a battle against Nazism, a battle against fascism, against religious intolerance. Right, um, against the persecution of religious minorities. Right? Um, we also have a bunch of justices who are still on the bench, who know that their previous decision was criticized. And we also have two new justices on the bench. Two of the, uh, the previous appointees from the 1920s had retired um, 
or left the court, um, and two new appointees from Franklin Roosevelt. Among them um, was Justice Robert Jackson, um, who would be assigned uh, the writing of the majority opinion in, this, in West Virginia versus Barnett. Now, just three years after Frankfurter's ruling in the Kubitis case, Jackson makes a, a different argument. Um, and he takes up the, the dissent that Stone had, had offered, that two-part dissent, partly about speech, partly about religious liberty. But Jackson really foregrounds the question of speech, making someone say something they don't believe, right? Now, the first thing he has to do is prove that it is speech, right? But when you uh, salute the flag, it's not, the students are not actually saying anything, right? Um, when, they, when they engage in it, but Jackson says, there is no doubt that the flag salute is a form of utterance. He says that symbols of all kinds offer, quote, a shortcut from mind to mind, right? They have the power to communicate something. Um, and he thinks that, the, that this is not just speech, but it is a form of forced speech, right? Um, making someone say something that they don't believe. He says, quote, to sustain the compulsory flag salute, we are required to say that a bill of rights that guards the individual's right to speak his own mind left it open to public authorities to compel him to utter what is not in his mind. So let me just read that again, because it's complicated. Right? To sustain the compulsory flag salute, meaning to uphold West Virginia's law, we are required to say that a Bill of Rights that guards the individual's right to speak his own mind, i.e. the First Amendment, somehow left it open to public authorities to compel him to utter what is not in his mind. Right? So what he's saying is the First Amendment can't you know, only work in one direction. Right? It can't protect you to say your mind and not um, protect you from being forced to say what's not in your mind. Right? And this is the notion of forced speech that Jackson is introducing here. Now, to drive this all home, now that he's figured out that it is speech and it's forced speech, he needs to say why Gubitis was wrong. And he takes his, his colleague, uh, Felix Frankfurter's logic and tears it apart sort of one step at a time, right? First of all, Frankfurter had said in the earlier case <clears throat> that the government's need to defend itself um, in wartime or other moments of crisis outweighs its uh, protections of civil liberties. He struck a different balance, right? And Jackson says, no, to enforce those rights today is not to choose weak government over strong government. Right? He says, we can actually have civil liberties in wartime. And then goes on in fact to say that they're all even more important in wartime um, to articulate what it is that Americans are fighting for. Second, in the earlier case, Frankfurter had, had written um, that, um, that for the court to get involved would make the Supreme Court, quote, the school board for the country, right? It would be too meddlesome, right? Um, for, the, for the Supreme Court um, to interfere with this level of local governance. And Justice Jackson says, no, no one who acts under the color of law is beyond the reach of the constitution. Right? And he has a longer quote, um, which I'll read, it's not on the slide. He says, if there's any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. Right? So basically, if there's any fixed star in our constellation, if there's anything you know, it's that no official can tell you what, um, what is orthodox in matters of opinion. No one can tell you what to think. And then Jackson goes on and sort of like, you know, not just sticks the knife and kind of turns it and says, if there are any circumstances which permit an exception, they do not now occur to us. So saying like, there's no balancing test to be done here, right? This is just no. Right? Um, his colleague Hugo Black would later describe the First Amendment and say, no law means no law. Right? There are no exceptions um, to his uh, defense of the First Amendment liberties. They are fundamental. Right? 
And that's related to the third point that he's trying to dismantle. By third, uh, Justice Frankfurter in the earlier Gobitis case had argued, this is a political question that is better left to the people of Pennsylvania than to unelected judges in Pennsylvania or Washington. Um, and Justice Jackson says, no. And that this is precisely the kind of thing, this is precisely the kind of reason why we have uh, courts in the first place, right? To protect the rights of, of particularly numerical minorities, whether they're religious minorities, ethnic, uh, cultural, or any kind of minority, and to protect minority opinion from, uh, from the overwhelming power of the majority in democratic um, elections. And he says, quote, fundamental rights may not be submitted to vote. They depend on the outcome of no elections. Right? Saying that in fact, um, you know, the court is, needs to do its job in this area. Right? All right, and then the fourth one is <clears throat> that uh, in the earlier case, Justice Frankfurter had said, compulsion in service of national unity can be sustained by the constitution. Right, that we do have to, you know, we might have to do this, right? Um, and, and national unity is a necessary end um, and it can authorize some compulsion. And Justice Jackson again says, no. And here he gets really sort of, uh, you know, sort of quite uh, intense in his language. He says, those who, begin, those who begin coercive elimination of dissent soon find themselves exterminating dissenters. This is a sentence that could only have been written in the middle of World War II, um, even if the full range of the Nazi Holocaust was not known until the end of World War II, the systematic uh, sort of uh, repression um, and, and incarceration and deportation of religious and political minorities was well known by 1943. Um, and this is very much on Justice Jackson's mind. He goes on to say, compulsory unification of opinion achieves only the unanimity of the graveyard. Right? So this is uh, both, this is language that is more sort of um, powerful, more florid, more robust than a lot of judicial opinions. Right? Um, and certainly worth thinking about as a full-throated defense of civil liberties in the middle of wartime. Now, you can imagine, um, not everyone agreed with this, right? Um, and one of the one of the justices didn't join um, with with Justice Jackson, and that was Justice Frank Murphy, um, one of, uh, one of the uh, one of the sort of recent appointees to the court um, by FDR. And Justice Murphy felt this was just about religious liberty. He didn't want to get it. Was this speech was it forced speech? He said religious liberty alone would protect the Jehovah's Witnesses. So he agreed in the outcome. And, but for a different reason. But there was a dissenting view, and you can probably guess who that would be, namely Justice Felix Frankfurter, still on the court, right? Um, and just three years after he had written the majority opinion in Kobitas, now finds himself in the minority in West Virginia versus Barnett. Uh, and he has a lot to say about this. And he starts off um, by responding very, indirectly um, to the way that Justice Jackson had hinted at the threat of Nazism um, as a threat to democracy, right? So if you back up, right, that, and say that those who begin coer coercive elimination of dissent soon find themselves exterminating dissenters, that would have um, been known to all Americans, but would also have been known um, to Justice Felix Frankfurter, one of the first, the second, or one of the no, third uh, Jewish justice on the Supreme Court um, in, uh, in its history, um, and who began his dissent uh, by actually talking specifically about that. Not directly, um, and in fact, it's very unusual for justices to speak from, where, from their identity, um, that in fact, justices wear black robes in many ways precisely to, to shield or hide their identities, to say they are neutral, right? But here, uh, Frankfurter says, one who belongs to the most vilified and persecuted minority in history is not likely to be insensible to the freedoms guaranteed by our constitution. 
right? So he's sort of putting that right out there on the very first um, you know, line of, of his descent. And he says, but as judges, we are neither Jew nor Gentile, neither Catholic nor agnostic. But he says, uh, we must make our decision not based on our personal preferences or our personal beliefs or identities, but for how the constitution works and how federal courts should operate. Right? He goes on um, to say that there are, um, that there's an important issue of precedent. Right? He says, that which three years ago had seemed to lie within permissible areas of legislation is now outlawed by the deciding shift of opinion of two justices. Right? He says, look, you know, something was constitutional in 1940, can't just become unconstitutional in 1943. The court has no reason for existence. It's no reason for existence if it merely reflects the pressures of the day. Right? And he felt very, Frankfurter had always been very committed to precedent um, and, he, and would continue that from the beginning of his time on the court uh, to the end and, and really felt that the court had no business overturning itself um, in two laws, in, in a law that was no different right, um, from the one that it had upheld in the Pennsylvania case just three years earlier. Frankfurter also pointed out that there were plenty of other things um, that the state um, managed to coerce people into doing. He pointed to vaccination, um, surely uh, an issue on everyone's minds these days. He pointed to food inspection. He pointed to the obligation to bear arms, i.e. the draft. He pointed to testimonial duties, i.e. You know, if you get a subpoena. He pointed to compulsory medical treatment, a whole series of things that, that in, in his time um, could not be objected to for religious reasons. He says, one may have the right to practice one's religion and at the same time owe the duty of formal obedience to laws that run counter to one's beliefs. Right? So Frankfurter says you can have it both ways. Right? <clears throat> one may have the right to practice one's religion and at the same time, owe the duty of formal obedience to laws that run counter to one's beliefs. Right? Jackson says that's a contradiction. But that's that's like a that's literally a contradiction in terms, right? You can't practice your religion and violate it at the same time, right? Um, just you know, as the Jehovah's Witnesses said, they they was happening to them. Frankfurter says no. In fact, you you can, right? Partly because if you get back to that question, right? Um, you know, at the beginning, um, what is is a flag salute making you say anything? Uh, is it really an accurate reflection of what you believe, or is it just a performance? And Frankfurter said it really doesn't stop you from believing anything and just to have to salute the flag. And furthermore, his other point, right, <clears throat> that um, the court has no reason for existence if it merely reflects the pressures of the day. So um, let me just wrap up with some legacies. Um, for where this case has gone. Um, Frank, uh, Frankfurter's minority view was, um, was seen as that, as a minority view. Um, the, the case was widely praised um, in the press, um, certainly widely praised by religious minorities um, and by other sort of people who held opposing views, unpopular views, political, religious, cultural, or otherwise over the course of the 20th century. In that sense, it's a real landmark um, for the First Amendment, um, far beyond the specifics of school salutes or flag salutes or the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, and it's endured through the rest of the 20th century. What you see here are uh, the Barnett sisters um, in, in 2006 um, at the Justice Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York, which is where he was originally from. Both of them have since uh, passed away, but they, um, they've they recorded their oral histories. Lily and Gobitis also recorded an oral history before she passed away. Those can be fun um, things to teach with, um, with students, just to kind of hear them in their old age reflecting on their school time um, experiences that brought them before the Supreme Court. Um, but the case had enduring legacies in several areas. First, um, for religious, uh, the, the extent to which someone can claim religious exemption from federal and state law. Um, so while this was in some way, this and conscientious objection to the draft were some of the first, um, others would follow. 
um, to medical treatment, um, to food laws, um, to, uh, to, to other forms of, 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 uh, of objection um, to state control. It also has a legacy for students' rights um, and, and, you know, uh, and raises some very important questions about the extent to which the First Amendment applies to students, either in school or out of school. Um, and also for uh, debates um, over the course of the 20th century about forced speech, um, when you can be forced to say something, right? And we can see this in a series of cases, right? Um, in the 1970s, um, there was a, a, another case brought by a Jehovah's Witness in New Hampshire, um, who uh, at a time when the New Hampshire uh, license plates looked like this. And they included, as they still do actually, the state motto, live free or die. Um, and Maynard believed that this uh, violated his religious beliefs. Um, and he, so he covered over the motto with um, basically electrical tape and was fined um, for um, basically for sort of damaging um, his license plate or making it unreadable. Uh, he challenged the fine, it went all the way to the Supreme Court, which again sort of articulated and affirmed this notion um, that, that forced speech um, is, uh, that you can make a forced speech objection under the First Amendment, right? That you can't be forced to say something that you don't believe by a state entity, either an individual state or the four, uh, through the 14th Amendment, the federal government. Um, another case where this has some, said some leg legacy is Texas versus Johnson from 1989, um, a flag burning case, highly controversial case from the 1980s, um, but where the court once again came down on the side of protection of unpopular and minority views um, on the grounds um, of individual liberty. Um, and again, th also thinking about what constitutes speech um, and, and how expressive actions, in this case, a protesting, a protester burning flag um, could actually also be part of the First Amendment. Right? Like I said, it also raises a lot of issues for students and classrooms, right? Um, it doesn't directly have an impact on all of these cases, but it certainly um, you know, can be worth teaching in a long line with other cases. Here you see two of the participants in Tinker versus Des Moines from 1969, in which students were, uh, were sort of speaking out against the Vietnam War um, and were doing so through a, by wearing these black armbands um, in a kind of form of silent protest that they claimed was not disruptive of the classroom um, and therefore was protected under the First Amendment. Okay. Um, and we also see it in, um, in more contemporary issues, right? So in the recent debates in the last few years over uh, the Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem, um, particularly in the National Football League, we can see this question, right? Um, is, uh, is the anthem um, a form of, of, of forced speech? Um, does it force people who, uh, who object to singing it um, to, um, to say something that they do not believe? And if so, are their rights uh, the same or different because they are in a workplace, right? In this case, uh, a football stadium, right? And what if the workplace by contrast is a cake shop, a uh, bakery um, owned by an evangelical Christian baker who opposes same-sex marriage defended under the laws of Colorado? How do those kinds of, those first amendment rights um, come into conflict with each other? So as you can see, these issues are, are still very much around um, and long after the Gobitis family brought their first case. Um, and I always like to end um, this, not just with the first page of Billy Gobitis's letter uh, to the Minersville School Board, uh, but, uh, but to the second where he says, um, I do not salute the flag, not, not because I do not love my country, but I love my country and I love God more and must obey his commandments. Right. And so I think it's, a, it's at a really young age, uh, a kid like this is making an argument um, before the Supreme Court about how he's balancing his religious obligations and his political obligations. Um, and I think it's just a great case, um, a series of cases that really show the enduring um, issues in the American constitution. Uh, I will stop there and turn it back to, to Kathy and, and see, hopefully there's some time for some questions and discussions.
so we do have some questions coming in and we have time um, for more. So if other people have some, feel free to go ahead and type them into your Q&A box or into the chat and we'll um, pass them over to Professor Capizola. And thank you, that was a great presentation. Um, so our first question is about the response, particularly to uh, the Barnett case. Was this case particularly subject to national controversy in light of the reversal of the precedent? Um, yes, uh, and so <clears throat> the the second case, right, um, the West Virginia versus Barnett case, um, was the outcome was widely applauded, uh, but there were people who shared Frankfurter's concerns that the, the precedent had been too quickly overturned, um, and that it um, it risked revealing the court to be more of a political institution um, than a judicial one, right? The distinction being that a, a political institution would reflect the politics of, of, of the people in, involved, like a legislature does. Um, and the judicial one is not supposed to merely reflect politics. It's supposed to be doing something else where it's interpreting the law and the constitution. Um, and there were people who were concerned about that. It's also worth remembering um, that this question of a Supreme Court switching its views had been national news just a few years earlier in 1937, right? So the, the proposed court packing plan by Franklin Roosevelt was in part designed, uh, was in part sort of brought to an end by the fact that the court itself started shifting its views, right? Um, and and shifting its rulings. And this is known in, in, as the switch in time that saved nine, right, which you've probably heard about. Um, but that switch in time, um, the idea of switching to reflect popular views and national politics was on, already on the table. Um, some people were in favor of it. Some people thought um, that it, it also might weaken the court's um, independence as, as a judiciary. And so all that's very much on, on, on the table. Okay, great. Um, so we have a couple of questions. So I'm going to try and lead into the next one, which is the first question is the response to uh, these cases. And you've mentioned a lot the criticisms of the first decision and then thus um, more approval of the second, but do they divide along political lines at all? Does this have a certain kind of partisan aspect to it? Um, it does, it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, there, um, there were certainly some, the, and, and, and also it doesn't necessarily stay with one, with one party over the course of the 20th century, right? So certainly as the case was being decided at the time, most of the people who supported the states were on the conservative side, which in the 1930s, conservatives could be found in both the Republican party and the Democratic party. Parties were more ideologically mixed at that time. And most of those supporting in individual liberty were, were on the liberal side. Um, but I think what I very briefly showed at, at the end, right, um, is, um, is that this issue has been taken up on, on all sides and uh, all across the political spectrum, right? Because of course, political minorities can be found everywhere um, on the political spectrum, right? And, and of course, religious and cultural and, and other minorities can be found there too. Um, so I think that that's, um, you know, it's not, it's not the, it began in the 1930s in the context of politics of the Supreme Court and the Roosevelt administration, um, but it didn't stay there. Okay, great. I mean, then we have a comment sort of also thinking about who's involved in which cases um, from someone who's mentioning that some of those later cases, they mentioned in particular the flag burning case, but that's also true of many others were not involving Jehovah's Witnesses. They're involved yeah. in other groups, right? Yes, so this is, uh, you know, it's sort of, um, in some ways it's, it's ironic that the, the, the Woolley versus Maynard case also involves a Jehovah's Witness um, as did these two um, cases from the 1940s. Um, but yes, the, the, the issues have been taken up by a number of groups, um, political, um, you know, political people with sort of uh, radical political views, that's the Texas versus Johnson case, um, people with, um, with, you know, with other religious views, um, so um, the, the owner of the Masterpiece Cake Shop in Colorado is not a Jehovah's Witness um, uh, I, but, and is an evangelical Christian, but not, not in the witnesses, uh, for sure. Okay, great. Uh, 
And then we have another question thinking about the present context, um, and I'm just going to read it as is. Of course, this applies to stating that you will or will not support mask wearing. This is most certainly a freedom of expressive speech. Um, do you have any comments or, or thoughts about that issue? I think, um, I mean, in some ways, the, the, the answer is we'll, we'll see. Um, and, you know, certainly most areas that have to my knowledge, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an expert on contemporary law um, uh, in that sense, but my understanding is that most areas that have adopted mandatory mask wearing have generally included religious exemptions um, for people who, um, and also exemptions for other people with physical disabilities and other reasons, um, but, in, but more relevant here, um, people um, who have, uh, you know, kind of reasons why they, they cannot um, wear them. Um, I think those have generally been, I mean, they've, they've been upheld um, and certainly the, def the protections for religious exemption to, to, other, to law um, are stronger now than they, are, than they were in the 1940s. Um, but I, and I think even in a year or so um, when, you know, we, you know hopefully, um, when we have a widely available vaccine, there will of course be people who have religious objections um, to it. And my assumption is that the law will accommodate those to some extent. The, the, it, the protections for that are much stronger than they might've been in both religious liberty and in, um, and in public health um, law more generally. Um, but I suppose I might defer to a recently published book um, by John Fabian Witt of Yale Law School on the history of public health law and epidemics um, that just came out um, and you know, I think a lot of people will be reading that um, as we move forward, not just to think about sort of quarantines, mask laws, et cetera, but also to a very, to very important questions about vaccination, um, which I think will be a political conversation that our country's gonna have to have in 2021. Okay. All right, um, anybody else have any questions before we, we are perfectly on time here. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, thank you, Professor Capazola, for your wonderful talk and for your answering of all of these questions. Um, again, to our attendees, the PowerPoint will be available and we will also have a recording um, of this session available and posted on both the ABA and FJC website. Um, please do join us um, next week, again, November 16th, also on Monday at 7.30 p.m. to Eastern time um, to hear some more discussion of possible ways you might teach these cases. And please visit both of our websites for other materials related to teaching federal trials, including the full case packet, which is on the FJC website um, that Professor Capazola mentioned. So thank you for that. And Kathy, did you have any last things to add? No, um, you'll be getting more information about the login for the subsequent program next week. Um, we'll be doing a Zoom room rather than the webinar. So it'll be a slightly different login information, but that's all to come. So thank you, Christine. Thank you, Professor Capazola. Wonderful conversation today. Thank you all.